the ability to abstractly represent the world and then the ability to operate effectively within it, to represent yourself socially in a way and then to carry through with that, because that enables people to trust you. So it's something like that. And so that produced cortical expansion and then women were selecting men who were good at that and that produced cortical expansion and then there's an arms race between women and men with regards to intelligence so the women kept up or they certainly kept up with, with, with intelligence as, as the evolutionary cycle continued but one of the consequences of selection for cortical expansion and increased cognitive flexibility was that the number of dominance hierarchies that human beings could produce started to multiply right because there's all sorts of ways that you can be successful there's you think about how many ways you can be successful in a modern culture and and you can be successful in dimensions that aren't really even associated with each other so you can be successful socially that that's what an extrovert would do you could be successful in terms of intimate relationships that's what a, an agreeable person would do a disagreeable person would be more successful with regards to competition a person who's high in neuroticism would be would be trying to protect themselves and to establish some sort of security an open person would be looking for a flexible creative environment and so there's this multiplicity of of ways that you can establish a dominance hierarchy and be successful in it and if you're creative you can come up with your own damn dominance hierarchy which is exactly what you're doing if you're creative right you you spin up a game that's your game and then you you make the rules and that's hard because if you make a new game with new rules it's hard to monetize it but you can be the best at playing that game and so that's a huge advantage to being creative if, if you can pull it off so then you think well what's happened among human beings is the multiplication of the set of possible dominance hierarchies so it's become very broad and then you could say well what's what's driving selection now is the ability to be successful across multiple sets of dominance hierarchies and that accounts at least in part for our cognitive flexibility and so that's really what a human being is a human being is a creature that has high potential for succeeding across a very wide range of potential human dominance hierarchies and so that gives us our transformative psyche that's the niche that that's the niche that we've both produced and occupy and I think it's out of that that hero mythology emerges fundamentally because I think what the hero is the mythological hero is a representation of that part of the psyche that's particularly good at being successful across sets of dominance hierarchies it's a very, very biological way of thinking about it, and I, I, I've thought about this for a long time, I, I can't see any way that that just can't be the case. I mean, how else, how else could it work? If we had a fixed behavioral pattern, like beavers, you know, you're the most successful beaver if you build the best dam, it's like, fine, then you know what's going to be selected for. But that isn't what people are like, and it's also why we're so multi-purpose, you know? We have hands. What, what's a hand for? What's the evolutionary function of a hand? Well, you, you can't specify that. You could say it's something like, well, a hand is useful for doing a whole bunch of different things with. Well, and mouth, tongue, same thing. What are words for? Well, it's the same thing. They're for, very, they're for communicating a very wide range of information. It's something like that. So we're, we're these weird general purpose animals. You know, we're not great at any one thing, but we can swim better than most terrestrial animals you know we can run faster than most animals and we can certainly run longer like a human being can run a horse to death over the course of a week if, if they're in good shape so like we're really good at being a multi-purpose entity like a rat you know where they call rats weedy species because they can be anywhere they don't have a specific niche like you know there's animals down in in uh, the Amazon that they're specialized for like one tree you know or one type of tree in one tiny little area that's not what human beings like is we're we're like cockroaches or rats which is a nasty comparison but we can go anywhere and thrive and so and so being particularly good at that being particularly good at being able to go anywhere and thrive also seems to me to be a canonical element of the hero mythology so so okay all right now I started to introduce all those topics because I was trying to address the issue of how it is that we've come to deal with the fact that things are so complex that we can't deal with them. And so a huge part of the answer to that is the Darwinian answer. One is, well, you keep up with things you can't keep up with by changing unpredictably. So there's, here's an example. You know, 
Sometimes if you're driving down the road and there's a deer on the road, maybe you'll run into it and it'll, instead of jumping out of the way, it sort of jumps randomly and then you run into it. You think, well that's a pretty stupid strategy, it's like natural selections at work there, but it turns out that deer jump randomly when wolves are chasing them. Well, why would you do that? Well, because you can't predict it, right? If, if something horrible is after you, acting unpredictably is actually a pretty good strategy, and that's basically what mutation does. It means the horrible thing that's after you always is the rapid transformation of the environment, and the only thing you can possibly do in that, in the, in that case is capitalize on chance. Okay, so that's one thing. So that's partly why the Darwinian story, I think, has to be right. Because the environment does move unpredictably. And the only way you can keep up with something that's unpredictable is to generate variants and hope that one of them has drawn the lucky lottery card. But then there's these additional issues, which is that we're also, we also seem to be tightly selected for the capacity to cooperate and compete, so that multiplies our cognitive ability. That's a huge part of it. And then we're also, we also seem to have constructed ourselves, so to speak, through sexual choice into these general problem general purpose problem solving creatures and so we've internalized some of the Darwinian process so you think well most animals will produce variants of themselves physically and then most of those variants die but human beings have built a lance built a mechanism let's say that's like a game engine I think that's a really good you know how there are game engines now that people have devised their, their, their computational devices and you can take a game engine and you can generate games with it, like computer games. So, um, the game engine is a mechanism for producing games. Well, that's what our brains are like. Our brains are game engines for producing games. And so, what happens is that, that when you think you produce an avatar of yourself, you produce a fictional world in, that that avatar inhabits, and maybe you produce multiple fictional worlds and multiple avatars. That's the you that could be tomorrow, which is what you're doing when you're planning and you walk the avatar through its potential roots and those that look good you keep and those that don't look good you kill and so you can then you can embody the ideas that you keep and act those out and hopefully the idea is that when you embody them you're successful and you don't get killed and so we're select we've also that when we've been selecting each other for cognitive prowess we've been selecting ourselves for the ability to generate avatars out of ourselves and kill them instead of dying. It's unbelievably brilliant. And, and that's really akin to the human discovery of the future. Right? The future is a place where variants of you could exist. It's something like that. And other animals don't seem to be able to do that. So, we're very sneaky. And, well, so far it doesn't seem to be working too badly, although we haven't been around for very long, right? I mean, human beings of our particular subspecies, about 150,000 years, something like that, which is from an evolutionary time frame, it's like, it's nothing, you know, it's 2,080 year old men, it's not very long, you know, if you think about it that way. Okay, so, now what I want to do is draw a relationship between that developmental process, that evolutionary process, and the emergence of these underlying motivational systems. It's something like this. So you imagine, you go back in time to the emergence of the development of nervous systems. So there's, there's cells that creatures use to, to produce motor output, and there's cells that creatures use to map the patterns around them onto themselves. And so those are, that's sensory, that's the sensory layer, so to speak. Imagine. Sensory layer, nervous layer, motor layer. In simpler animals, you just have sensory motor cells. Then they diversify. Sensory layer, nervous layer, motor layer. In fact, that's actually what you consist of when you're first developing in utero. After the blastocyte stage, when your cells differentiate, that's the differentiation. Sensory layer, nervous layer, motor layer. So then you think there's a sensory layer. Now what's that sensory layer doing? You think about the world as consists, consisting of patterns of all sorts, like maybe there's an animal in the ocean and it's being subjected to wave motion and so 
its sensory systems map the wave motion onto the motor output. So if you look at a sponge, for example, sponges are good examples because they're sort of half unicellular animals and half multicellular animals. You can take a sponge and run it through a colander and separate it out into cells, say in salt water, and it'll assemble itself back into a sponge. So it's sort of at the, yeah, amazing, eh? It's kind of what you do in utero. It, it, the, the cells somehow know enough to communicate with another to, one another to organize themselves into an organism. It's, it's unbelievable. We have no idea how people do that because when you're in the initial form, blastocyte form, all those cells are identical genetically. And then all of a sudden they differentiate and they move to the places they're supposed to go. We have no idea how that, how the hell can that happen? These cells are all identical, except for their position. So they're obviously communicating with one another in some unbelievably complicated way and saying, well, you, you're this sort of cell and so you're going to differentiate that way. God only knows. But anyway, sponges can do this. Now, a sponge isn't complicated enough to have the sensory layer and the nervous layer and the motor layer. It's just sensory motor cells, if I remember correctly. But what the sponge is trying to figure out is it wants to get water through its pores inside because that's how it eats. And so there's wave motion constantly, and so what's happening is the wave motion is a pattern, and the sponge is reacting to that in a patterned way. And that's a really, it's really useful to think about what you're responding to as patterns instead of objects, because we think we react to objects, but objects are actually a specific subcategory of pattern. And so, because it also helps to explain perception, it's like, what does it mean for you to see something? Well, it means a bunch of things, but one of the things it means is, when I look at that thing, it manifests itself to me as a grippable object. I mean, that, that's built into the way I see it. So, if, if you think about the way that you see that on the surface there, you can tell that it's separate from the surface because it has a bit of a shadow, and it's a different color, and it's obviously shaped for a hand, and so that thing tells you when you look at it that it's a grabbable object. Well, it's, it's hand-shaped, like a stone tool would be. and so. And the things around you in the world manifest themselves as patterns of utility. That, that's the appropriate way to think about it. You say, well, what does this thing mean? Because that's a hard question. Well, one of the things that your eyes do, it's like, imagine you've got this representational surface at the back of your retina. It's made out of pixels, roughly speaking, right? Those are the cells. And what it does is map that pattern onto your retinal pattern. And then the retinal pattern propagates itself as a nervous pattern along your optic nerve and then that manifests itself as a neurological pattern. And that neurological pattern manifests itself as an action pattern. And so the meaning of the object is the action pattern that is mapped onto the, onto the percept. And so what does this mean? This is what it means. You think this is a Piagetian observation, it's like one or many. One, right? Because I'm acting like it's one. But if I do this, then it's many. Why? One, two, right? They're separably manipulable entities. And so the concept of number is, in fact, predicated, at least in part, on the idea of singular usability. But you're mapping it. It's like, well, what is this? It's a key. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm mapping that shape into this motion for that action. You say, well, it's not just a key. It's a weapon, right? And so that's because I've mapped it onto a different output pattern. But if you think about perception as the matching of patterns onto patterns, it makes, it, makes way more sense. You can really start thinking about how perception works because then you can also start thinking about unconscious perception. So, you know, the... The blind sight experiments show, for example, that if, if you've had cortical damage, so you, you think you're blind, you, you can't see objects anymore. But I show you a picture of a frightened face, you'll show a skin conductance response to it, and you think, well, how the hell can that happen? It's like, I have to see the face in order to infer the emotion in order to have the reaction. It's like, no, you don't. You don't need that at all. You need a pattern recognition system that maps that right onto an amygdalic output that produces physiological readiness. You don't need the perceptible entity, because you know you think, you see something, and then you think about the thing, and then you evaluate the thing, and then you act. It's like, you do do that, but there are parts of you that don't do that at all. Way faster parts, more primordial parts. And so, another example would be Darwin's 
trick with the snake that I told you about. He'd go to this museum that had a cobra in a glass cage. And the cobra, he'd put his face up to the glass cage and the cobra would strike at him. And he'd go like this. And there was no way he could control that. Well, it's because...